Yo, Ajad. Yeah. My immersion. There we go. We're gonna start off with some snack time. Cause... Mama's had a day. <laughs> I've, I've had a day. Oh. Feeling a lot better though. You had a spidey sense, didn't you, Edgehead? You told me to be careful, and I was careful, but those anti-cut gloves lied to me. It's okay, my dad is getting me literal chain mail. So, uh, I don't foresee that happening again in the near future. If you think I'm kidding, that's cute. Actually, how's this look? Jank as fuck. Jank as fuck. Yes. There are chainmail gloves. And I am getting a pair. Hold up, I'm gonna open chat on my laptop here. And if stream experiences interruptions, forgive me, we're having a... We're having some weather. I'm sure y'all know about weather. Just give me a moment. I'm still eating snack too. So we're just gonna let y'all warm up a wee bit. Yeah, it's not the worst background. I think it's a. I think it's a. Russ is playing SCP. I haven't played that game in a long ass time. Or also, I haven't watched him in a long ass time. Only streamers I've really been watching have been, uh, Sneaky Russian, Angus Greybush. And, uh... Chaos. Got to throw meds in your face when you use the loo? No problem. 
we're still on the snack. Um, um, fucking, we're still on snack time. Oh, for snack? Ice cream. Vanilla ice cream with rainbow sprinkles. The tried and true. It's never going to give you up. It's never going to let you down. It's never going to run around and hurt you. No fair, get some yourself. Yeah, sure. Take mine. Never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down. Can you, uh, can you guys hear the the crackly fire and the wind blowing? Or do I just look like an idiot? Okay, good. I was shaking it up from the rain last time. But we can add a little rain. Both? What do you mean both? Oh. Full disclosure, I'm on pain medication, so this might be one of them fun streams. Also, get ready for lots of mahjong, because I should give this finger a rest. Mm. So if I'm doing WASD, it's got to be gentle. Oh, for Mahjong? We're exactly where we left off. No. We're exactly where we left off. I fucked up and I came back. <laughs> but there was a lot of fishing. Alright. Snack time's over. Now is spook time. Yeah. You guys ready for spook time? Well, I gave my mom a spook. There was blood everywhere. Oh, that's a person burning. I don't know if I'm down with that. I didn't realize what that was. Okay. Uh, unsubscribe. Yes. Oh god, my ugly fucking... Recommended seasonal wallpaper. See more. Eh. Let's see. Oh, some of these might not be safe for work. Um... Hmm. May as well go with what's installed. Ba ba da ba. Ba ba da ba da 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 da. Give me a moment. Sorry for the immersion break. La da la da do do la do. Yes, I have the American wood egg. Uh, 
Where the fuck is the fireplace? I know I had one. I mean, that would be cool, but it makes no sense for right now. Also cool, but doesn't make sense right now. Here we go. Do I have something better than that? Yeah, I like this one slightly better. Alright, that goes back to the default ones. Alright. I would like to find my old one back. Where'd I put that? It's here somewhere. Sorry, chat. Give me a moment. I get surprisingly OCD about things. Okay, yes, you. Can I favorite you? Uh, not really. Play in window. What? All right, neat. I know that that's a thing now. Okay, neat. All right, whatever. Me fishing, I know. Okay. So chat. We want to start off with Lovecraft, Lovecraft inspired, Irish, or something that I wrote. Or if Chaos is here and wants to throw something at me, he absolutely can. Welcome back, just in time for the feature presentation. Oh wait, Edgehead is no longer here. Oh fuck. Sorry, Edgehead. Not Edgehead, fuck, chaos. Edgehead, you're still here. OG content? I let me let me hook you up with that sweet, sweet OG content. It's not that OG. I wrote this like in twenty seventeen for the first holiday holiday the first Halloween stream ever on this channel. Um, and I wrote it while I was in a much different place mentally. Um, much different headspace. But it's aged well, I think. I haven't really written too much horror since then. I should, but I, I just haven't. Um, let me find it. It's, it's been, it's been a minute. Alright. God, I always get a little self-conscious before reading it. Okay. We're good. So. <laughs> yes, so I wrote this. Um, it's called Username Saya. If you want to read along, feel free. I might bumble my words because I'm on medication, but you know. Rip. Okay. It's not a novel idea from anyone that people suffering from loneliness, IRL, often seek out company on the internet. A vast sea of people funneled by interests, even to some extent personality. The world on the web has been rapidly becoming almost as complex as the world around it, forming cultures and communities with small tribes that feud and large fan bases that rally together. Now, in the quiet of this black, cold night, it's natural to wonder if the internet is developing its own ghosts and monsters, too. 
It's hard to live in a place that no one understands you. I was never great at making friends around me. Classmates, coworkers, random strangers that drift past you before you even process them. They all seemed unreachable and uninteresting to me. However, in the late night chats with strangers on online chat rooms and forums, I found something. Instead of the monotony and nothingness of the real world, I felt a drive. There was something exhilarating about the anonymity. I found fulfillment beyond anything I could imagine, seeking in those physically near me. Pleasures outside of any degree of propriety that would be tolerated by the boring mainstream culture surrounding my bedroom. But most of those connections would form and break quickly, just becoming a blur of experiences, instant gratification. Then there was Saya. I met her around four in the morning on a weekend, in the chat of an odd disjointed stream of a strange and obscure game I've since either forgotten or blocked out of my memory. The chat was fast, far from empty, maybe a couple hundred viewers. But Saya stood out to me. A few playful remarks to each other in the public chat led us into private messaging. My god. She was electrifying. Radiant, even. Cold in her speech, with a slicing sense of sarcasm, a biting sense of humor. She spoke in riddles and mysteries, making me work for any small droplet of information, and yet still managing to keep me trying keep rolling the dice with the words I could say, trying to gamble in the rigged game of trying to get more of her. I found out quite a bit, after hours of trying, after coming back to the little chat box of private messages night after night, between boring day after insipid, worthless day, burning the pale purple text of her username into the back of my head when I closed my eyes because I spent so long staring at it. She was five feet and six inches tall, lived somewhere with heavy snowfall in the winter and mild summers in the mountain standard time zone. She was a Sagittarius, switching tones, in my opinion, rapidly, from seductive to empathetic, to cold, to fiery, to mischievous sometimes blending them to the point where you wouldn't really know how she felt when she was saying something, rather typing something. But over time, I started to hear her voice in my head as I read her words, a soft, silken voice, laced in the same enigma that shrouded her. During the day, I was growing distracted. During the night, I had no rest. Even while I was asleep, it seemed I was still puzzling over her. She was 23 years old. She was a dancer once, but she no longer performed. She used to do quite a bit of painting when she was younger, but those works were lost to time. That meant her father threw them in the fire. She once liked jazz, but now she's more into electronic music. When I asked her which artists, she named artists I recalled being popular a number of years ago. When I named more recently popular artists, she seemed not to recognize their names at all. She said if we were to ever find each other in person, she'd gladly make out me to the tune, though. Before I could get more about that, I was lost in the sexual hallucination of imagining all the little details of her body she'd described at times before, and continued my quest to uncover tantalizing detail at the agonizingly Yet alluringly slow pace, she revealed such information. The other girls I'd been talking to started to feel ignored. Their usually interesting and satisfying banter became boring to me. I could only think of Saya. She started asking me if I cared about her at all, what I was to her. Asked if I'd tear into her to pieces if we met. I swore to her I wouldn't. I tried to convey in cold characters what I would have said in tender whispers. I'd never been more fascinated by someone in my life. She said she was unclean. 
I asked what she meant. And she went offline. I was thrown into a stormy and torturous sleep of tossing and turning, seeing what my imagination forged of her image from her descriptions, flickering and flitting around in shadow. I started entirely missing tasks at work. My mother called. I'd said I'd haven't given her updates on how I've been doing in two months. I was disturbed by this, this change in me, but somehow I didn't care. Saya, Saya, Saya. Hard chats had been growing more and more heated and passionate now, but I've lost the details to time. Her response time started to vary more than it ever had before. There were pauses. I longed to hear her, really this time. I asked if she had a mic of any kind. She told me she had one once. And if I played my cards right, she'd go find it again. Crimson, golden, brown, emerald leaves started falling. And for the first time in my life, I didn't give a shit. Saya. 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 She asked me how I felt about women who'd been defiled. I asked what she meant. She said some deep part of me probably already knew. And she was right. I slept again and saw her pain. Black scars all over areas I'd imagined pristine somehow making her even more tempting. I felt sick with myself, but she laughed and didn't seem to care. She'd said I've enjoyed her screaming nevertheless. A cold feeling in my stomach didn't dissipate for days. I started scanning for her to come online during the day. She never did. So as the sun was up and every idle moment, I'd replay all the things we said through my head over and over again trying to find patterns, trying to find a way in, into what? I wasn't sure. October's chilly winds, once a favorite thing of mine to walk in, became annoying to me. Everything was a waste of time except for Saya. I remember the date, despite the rest of time being condemned to a bore. It was the 27th of October. I felt energized during the day for the first time in a long while. Started talking to strangers, started focusing on work, called my mother. Say I was still on my mind through all of it, but I cherished this sunny day for some reason. Not quite rushing as fast into the night as I would have normally. Maybe some part of me felt like maybe this would be my last day. I sat down at my desk, logged on, and immediately opened the conversation with Saya. This is the only conversation I remember in any sort of detail. Other than that, it's just been fragments littered all over my mind like shattered glass, shards burying into the flesh of my brain. We opened with the usual pleasantries, asking each other how the day was and her always vague response. Then things turned serious. How would you like to spend forever with me? She asked, but this time I really thought I heard echoes of her voice resonating through my head even though all I could receive to were typed word on the screen. I took a deep breath and told myself that, but I could still hear her voice, soft with just a bit of rasp, inexplicable. I hesitated, trying to find a good answer to the question. Well, I, I don't know, I murmured to myself as I typed the same words. We, s we still have a lot of each other to get to know. Well, I know enough. I want to stay with you. Her voice was more present in my head. I looked away from the screen, trying to straighten myself out. It's impossible. You can't hear her. I don't even know where to find you, I explained. How would we even find each other? I have already found you. That's all we need. Loud and clear. Even the rational part of me couldn't dispute it. I could hear her. What do you mean you've already found me? You're creeping me out, Saya. Take a deep breath, pause, and then write. Also, 
Why can I hear you? All I needed was your username. <laughs> she chuckled. Besides, even if you looked, you're never gonna find me. Not where you'd know where to search. A pause. Saya, I'm being serious. I've been dead for three years. Her voice was deadpan. All of my blood ran cold suddenly. All of the color in the world seemed to run out the window's pale light, except for that purple username. I left on my own terms. That's all that ever was on my own terms. No one understands. They didn't even understand what they all did. But you understand, don't you? I can hear the smile in her voice now. You're gonna stay with me forever, right? It's not funny, Saya. If you're joking around like that, you should get some help. I closed my eyes after hitting enter, telling myself this was all a prank and poor tastes. It is the season for stupid jokes, right? I've found help. I've found you. I heard her voice. My eyes were closed. It's not a prank. My eyes flew open, my hands flew from my face back to the keyboard. And I read the type that was normally white on that black background and blood red. <laughs> What's happening? Oh, come on. Don't you want to get to know me more intimately? You've been saying that for so long. What are you? I'm Saya. No. What are you? Suddenly, all the power went out in the apartment, every let off. Even battery powered devices switched to darkness. My alarm clock my alarm clock started to blink zero zero colon zero zero. My computer turned itself back on, but it was full screen. Just the chat box with Saya and I. Her text was blood red, apart from the pale purple username. You know what a ghost is, right? She asked, her chuckle echoing in my head. <laughs> well, imagine if those existed on the internet. If someone, while living, was so emotionally tied to a place built on the web. A place where she was defiled, tortured, and yet, a place she belonged. How are you doing this? I screamed at the screen, forgetting to type, but I guess she heard anyway, because she started typing in response. Those three dots pulsating. Those few who know I exist describe me like a virus, jumping from one host to the next, perpetuating myself. But I prefer to think of myself as just very lonely, looking for a warm place to spend my time stuck on Earth. Mm, and you've been so warm and inviting. The hell do you want from me? I hissed through my teeth. My computer made an angry beeping sound, and my alarm clock went dark, and then revived again, reading 99 colon 99 in vermilion red change from its former soothing green. I'm going to rip out your soul and occupy the space that's left behind, she growled, and it's too late to stop me. Immediately, I felt like there was a pulse of electricity running through my hand up my arm straight into my chest. I yanked my body away from the machine. I felt a strange emptiness, a void seeping into my consciousness. Not hot, not cold, not pain, not comfort. Just oblivion. I have no idea how I was able to do this, but I got up in all the shock, stumbled out of my apartment. I didn't even bother locking behind me. Ran down the stairs in a fever scrambles. Parts of my vision started to flicker and glitch like an old security camera. I rushed through the apartment lobby and tripped falling straight into the part uh, into the fountain. I couldn't breathe for a second, not even realizing I hit water. 
I felt something scream and recoil inside me. And then, I was aware of pain, searing, in my knee, my shoulder, my head, where my body had met the tile and concrete of the fountain. I reared up my head, opened my eyes, saw my nose running with blood into the once pristine water, my soaked clothes. I was dizzy with panic. Security personnel, eyebrows raised, helped me get out of the fountain, and then into an ambulance where they kept me overnight and psychologically evaluated me. Apparently I'd been talking nonsense. When I re-entered my apartment, it was like nothing had ever happened. Never revisited the site I found Saya. I started to reconnect with my family and my friends with people I hadn't spoken to in years. I stood more positive chats, trying to feel normal again. But it's hard to feel normal again. When you feel something inside you just barely hanging on by a thread. My soul. Say it, it almost torn it straight out. I now live my life in a state of semi-emptiness, fighting to stay where I am, trying to be in every moment, and it feels like I'm always a breath from slipping away. I know you may not believe my story, but please take my warning. Beware the monsters on the internet, of both the supernatural and unfortunately natural kind. Beware, Saya. Ta da! <laughs> it's not the best reading of that I've ever done, but if you want to see other readings, there's a whole archive channel. Also, hey, Thunder Kitty. So, yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> um. Yes. Twas me. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you guys liked it. For those of you who have been around a long time, I hope you're not bored of it. I'll write new material someday, but for now it'll do. So, do we want some Lovecraft, some Halloween flavored Lovecraft inspired stuff, or Irish? Because I could do all of those. Jesus, the dead smile is fucking 30 pages? Maybe not that one, jeez. Oh! The Moonbug by Lovecraft. In the Irish book. Nice. All the spoops. Halloween. Alright, you guys want the Halloween ones? Alright. Well... I could do the moon bug in this book, and then hop. Two ninety one. Two ninety one. It's toward the end. Seven. Moonbug by H.P. Lovecraft. Ba -ba -da -ba. <laughs> All right. Let's get on with it. Somewhere. To what remote? In fearsome region, I know not. Dennis Barry has gone. 
I was with him in the last night he lived among men, and I heard his screams when the thing came to him. But all the peasants and police and county math could never find him, or the others, though they searched long and far. And now I shudder when I hear the frogs piping in the swamps, or see the moon in lonely places. I had known Dennis Barry well in America, where he had grown rich and had congratulated him when he brought back the old castle bought back the old castle by bog at sleepy Kildury. it was from Kildury that his father had come and it was there that he wished to enjoy his wealth among ancestral scenes men of his blood had once ruled over Kildury and built and dwelt in the castle but those days were very remote so that for generations the castle had been empty and decaying. After he went to Ireland, Barry wrote me often, and told me how under his care the grey castle was rising tower by tower to its ancient splendour, how the ivy was climbing slowly over the restored walls as it had climbed so many centuries ago, and how the peasants blessed him for bringing back the old days with his gold from over the sea. But in time there came troubles, and the peasants ceased to bless him, and fled away instead, as from doom. And then he sent a letter, and asked me to visit him, for he was lonely in the castle with no one to speak, to save the new servants and laborers he had brought from the north. The bog was the cause of all these troubles, as Barry told me, the night I came to the castle. I'd reached Kildare in the summer sunset, as the gold of the sky lighted the green of the hills and groves and the blue of the bog, where, on a far islet, a strange olden ruin glistened spectrally. That sunset was very beautiful, but the peasants at Belly Low had warned me against it, and said Kildary had become accursed, so that I almost shuddered to see the high turrets of the castle gilded with fire. Barry's motor had met me at Ballylow Station, for Kildare is off the railway. The villagers had shunned the car, and the driver from the north, but had whispered to me with pale faces when they saw I was going to Kildare. And that night, after our reunion, Barry told me why. The peasants had gone from Kildare because Dennis Barry was to drain the Great Bog. For all his love of Ireland, America had not left him untouched, and he hated the beautiful wasted space where the peat might be cut and land opened up. The legends and superstitions of Kildare did not move him, and he laughed when the peasants first refused to help, and then cursed him and went away to Ballyville, with their few belongings as they saw his determination. In their place, he sent for laborers from the north, and when the servants left, he replaced them likewise. But it was lonely among strangers, so Barry had asked me to come. When I had heard the fears which had driven the people from Kildare, had laughed as loudly as my friend had laughed. For those fears were of the vaguest, wildest, and most absurd character. They had to do with some preposterous legend of the bog, and of a grim guardian spirit that dwelt in the strange olden ruin, on the far islet I had seen in the sunset. There were tales of dancing lights in the dark of the moon, and chill winds when the night was warm, of wraiths in white hovering over the waters, and of an imagined city of stone deep down below the swampy surface. But foremost, among weird fancies, and alone in its absolute unanimity, was that of the curse, waiting him who should dare to touch or drain the vash reddish morass. There were secrets, said the peasants, which must not be uncovered, secrets that had lain hidden since the plague came to the children of Partholon in the fabulous years beyond history. In the Book of Invaders, it is told that these sons of the Greeks were all buried at Talak. But old men in Kildare said that one city was overlooked saved by its patron moon goddess, so that only the wooded hills buried it when the men of Nemed swept down from Scythia in their thirty ships. 
Such were the idle tales which had made the villagers leave Kildry, and when I heard them, I did not wonder that Dennis Barry had refused to listen. He had, however, great interest in antiquities, and proposed to explore the bog thoroughly when it was drained. The white ruins on the islet had he had often visited, but through their age it was plainly great, though their age was plainly great, and their contour very little like that of most ruins in Ireland, they were too dilapidated to tell the days of their glory. Now the work of drainage was ready to begin, and the laborers from the north were soon to strip the forbidden bog of its green moss and red heather, and kill the tiny shell-paved streamlets and the quiet little pools fringed with rushes. After Barry had told me these things, I was very drowsy, for the travels of the day had been worrying, and my host had talked late into the night. A manservant showed me to my room, which was in a remote tower overlooking the village, and the plain at the end, at the and the plain at the edge of the bog, and the bog itself, so I could see from my windows in the moonlight the silent roofs, from which the peasants had fled, and which now shelter the labourers from the north, and two, the parish church with its antique spire, and far out across the brooding bog, the remote olden ruin of the islet gleaming white and spectral. Just as I dropped to sleep, I fancied I heard faint sounds from the distance, sounds that were wild and half-musical, and stirred me with a weird excitement, which colored my dreams. But when I awakened the next morning, I felt it had all been a dream, for the visions I had seen were more wonderful than any sound of wild pipes in the night. Influenced by the legends that Barry had related, my mind had in slumber hovered around a stately city in a green valley, where marble streets and statues, villas and temples, carvings and inscriptions all spoke in certain tones, the glory that was Greece. When I had told the dream to Barry, we both laughed, but I laughed the louder, because he was perplexed about his labors from the north. For the sixth time, they had all overslept, waking very slowly and dazedly, and acting as if they had not rested, although they were known to have gone early to bed the night before. That morning and afternoon I wandered alone through the sun-gilded village, and talked now and then with idle laborers, for Barry was busy with the final plans for beginning the work of the drainage. The laborers were not as happy as they might have been, for most of them seemed uneasy over some dream which they had. Yet they tried in vain to remember. I told them of my dream, but they were not interested at all until I spoke of the weird sounds that I thought I'd heard. Then they looked oddly at me, and said that they seemed to remember weird sounds as well. In the evening, Barry dined with me and announced that he would begin draining in two days. I was glad, for although I disliked to see the moss and the heather and the little streams and lakes taken apart, I had a growing wish to discern the ancient secrets of the deep matted peat might hide. And that night, my dreams of piping flutes and marble peristyles came to a sudden and disquieting end, for upon the city in the valley I saw pestilence descend, and then a frightful avalanche of wooded slopes that covered the dead bodies in the streets, and left unburied only the temple of Artemis on the high peak where the aged moon priestess Cleis lay cold and silent, with the crown of ivory on her silver head. I said that I waked suddenly and in alarm. For some time I could not tell whether I was waking or sleeping, for the sound of flutes still rang shrilly in my ears. When I saw on the floor the icy moonbeams and the outlines of the latticed gothic window, I decided I must be awake and in the castle of Kildary. Then I heard a clock from some remote landing below the strike the hour of two, and I knew I was awake. Yet there came that monotonous piping from afar, wild, weird airs that made me think of some dance of fawns and undistant millennials. Menalos? Menalos. Sure, we'll go with that. It would not let me sleep, and in impatience I sprang up and paced the floor. Only by chance did I go to the north window and look out upon the silent village and the plain at the end of the bog. 
had no wish to gaze abroad, for I wanted to sleep, but the flutes tormented me, and I had to do or see something. How could I have suspected the thing I was to behold? There in the moonlight that flooded the spacious plain was a spectacle which no mortal having seen it could ever forget. To the sound of reedy pipes that echoed over the bog, there glided silently and eerily a mixed throng of swaying figures, reeling through such revel as the Sicilians may have danced to Demeter in the old days under the harvest moon beside the Sihan. The wide plain, the golden moonlight, the shadowy moving forms, all above, the shrill, monotonous piping, produced an effect which almost paralyzed me. Yet I noted amidst my fear that half of these tireless mechanical dancers were the laborers whom I thought asleep, whilst the other half were strange airy beings in white, half indeterminate nature but suggesting a pale, wistful naiads from the haunted fountains of the bog. I do not know how long I gazed at this sight from the lonely turret window, before I dropped suddenly in a dreamless swoon, out of which the high sun of morning roused me. My first impulse upon awakening was to commu all, communicate all my fears and observations to Dennis Berry, but I saw the sunlight glowing through the latticed window. I became sure that there was no reality in what I thought I had seen. I am given to strange phantasms, yet I am never weak enough to believe in them. So on this occasion I contented myself with questioning the laborers who slept very late and recalled nothing of the previous night save the misty dreams of shrill sounds. The manner of spectral piping harassed me greatly, and I wondered if the crickets of autumn had come before their time to vex the night and haunt with the visions of men. Later the day, I watched Barry in the library poring over his plans for the great work which was to begin on the morrow. For the first time, I felt a touch of the same kind of fear that had driven the peasants away. For some unknown reason, I dreaded the thought of disturbing the ancient bog and its sunless secrets, and pictured terrible sights lying black under the immeasured death of age-old peat these secrets should be brought to light seemed injudicious, and I began to wish for an excuse to leave the castle and the village. I went so far as to talk casually to Barry on the subject, but I did not dare continue after he gave his resounding laugh. So I was silent when the sun set gently over the far hills, and the kildare blazed all red and gold in a flame that seemed important. Whether the events of that night were of reality or illusion, I shall never ascertain. Certainly they transcend anything we dream of in nature and the universe. Yet, no normal fashion can I explain those disappearances, which were known to all men after it was over. I retired early and full of dread, and for a long time I could not sleep in the uncanny silence of the tower. It was very dark and although the sky was clear and the moon was now well into the wane, and I would not rise till the small hours, I thought, as I lay there of Dennis Berry, and what would befall Bach when the day came, and found myself almost frantic with an impulse to rush out into the night, take Barry's car and drive madly to Ballylow, out of the menaced lands. But before my fears could crystallize into action, I'd fallen asleep gazed into dreams, upon the city and the valley, cold and dead, under a shroud of hideous shadow. Probably it was a shrill piping that awaked me, yet the piping was not what I had noticed first when I opened my eyes. I saw lying with my back to the east window overlooking the bog, where the waning moon would rise, and therefore expected to see light cast on the opposite wall before me. But I had not looked for such a sight as now appeared. Light indeed glowed on the panels ahead, but it was not any light the moon gives. Terrible and piercing was the shout of ruddy refulgence that streamed through the gothic window, and the whole chamber was brilliant 
and a splendor intense and unearthly. My immediate actions were peculiar for such a situation, but it is only in tales that a man does the dramatic and foreseen thing. Instead of looking out across the bog toward the source of the moonlight, I kept my eyes from the window in panic fear and clumsily drew on my clothing with some dazed idea of escape. I remember seizing my revolver and hat, but before it was over I lost them both without firing one or donning the other. At a time the fascination of the red radiance overcame my fright, and I crept to the east window and looked out whilst the maddening incessant piping whined and reverberated through the castle and all over the village. Over the bog was a deluge, a flaring light, scarlet and sinister, and pouring from the strange olden moon on the far island. The aspect of that room I cannot describe, and I must have been mad, for it seemed to rise majestic and undecayed, splendid and column-cinctured, the flame reflecting marble of its entablature. Entablature? Entablature? Entablature piercing the sky like an apex of the temple on a mountain top. Flutes shrieked and drums began to beat, and I watched in awe and terror as I thought. I saw the sultan form silhouetted grotesquely against the vis vision of marble and effulgence. That effect was titanic, altogether unthinkable, and I might have stared indefinitely, had not the sound of the piping seemed to grow stronger at my left. Trembling with a terror, oddly mixed with ecstasy, I crossed the circular room to the north window, from which I could see the village in the plain at the edge of the bog. There my eyes dilated again, with a wild wonder as great as if I had just turned from a scene beyond the pale of nature. For on the ghastly, red and plain, was moving a procession of beings in such a manner as none ever saw before, save in nightmares. Half gliding, half floating in the air, the white clad bog wraiths were slowly retreating toward the still waters, and the island grew in a fantastic formations, suggesting some kind of ancient and solemn ceremonial dance. Their waving translucent arms guided by the detestable piping of those unseen flutes, beckoned an uncanny rhythm to a throng of lurching laborers who followed dog-like, with blind, brainless, floundering steps, as if dragged by a clumsy, but resistless demon will. Re resistless demon will. As the naiads neared the bog, without altering their course, a new line of stumbling stragglers zigzagged drunkenly out the castle, from some door far below my window, groped sightlessly across the courtyard and through the intervening bit of village, and joined the floundering column of laborers on the plain. Despite their distance below me, I had once knew they were the servants brought from the north, for I recognized the ugly and unwieldy form of the cook, whose very absurdness had now become unutterably tragic. The flutes piped horribly, and again I heard the beating of the drums from the direction of the island room. Then silently and gracefully the naiads reached the water, and melted one by one into the ancient bog, while the line of followers, never checking their speed, splashed awkwardly after them, and vanished amidst a tiny vortex of unwholesome bubbles which I could barely see in the scarlet light. And as the last pathetic straggler, the fat cook, sank heavily out of sight in the sullen pool, the flutes and the drums grew silent, and the blinding red rays of the maroons snapped instantaneously out, leaving the village of doom lone and desolate in the wan beams of My condition was now of one of indescribable chaos, not knowing whether I was mad or sane, sleeping or waking. It was saved only by a merciful numbness. I believe I did ridiculous things 
such as offering prayers to Artemis, Latona, Demeter, Persephone, and Pluton. All that I recalled of classic youth came to my lips as the horror of the situation roused my deepest superstitions. I felt that I had witnessed the death of the whole village. I knew I was alone in the castle with Dennis Barry, whose boldness had brought down a doom. As I thought of him, new terrors convulsed me, and I fell to the floor, not fainting, but physically helpless. Then I felt the icy blast from the east window where the moon had risen. I began to hear the shrieks in the castle far below me. Soon the shrieks had attained a magnitude and quality which cannot be written of, which make me faint as I think of them. All I can say is that they came from something I had known as a friend. At some time during the shocking period, the cold wind and screaming must have roused me. For my next impression is of racing madly through the inky rooms and corridors, and out across the courtyard into the hideous night. They found me at dawn, wandering mindless toward near Barleylo. But what unhinged me utterly was not any of the horrors I had seen or heard before. What I muttered about as I came slowly out of the shadows was a pair of fantastic incidents which occurred in my flight. Incidents of no significance, yet which haunt me unceasingly when I am alone in certain marshy places or in moonlight. As I fled from the accursed castle, along the bog's edge, I heard a new sound, a common, yet unlike any I had heard before at Kildare. Stagnant waters, lately quite devoid of animal life, now seemed teemed like a horde of slightly, s slimy, enormous frogs, which piped shrilly and incessantly in tones strangely out of keeping with their size. They glistened floated in green in the moonbeams, and seemed to gaze up at the fount of light. I followed the gaze of one very fat and ugly frog, and saw the second of things which drove my senses away. Stretching directly from the strange golden moon into the far islet of the waning moon, my eyes seemed to trace a beam of faint, quivering radiance having no reflection in the waters of the bog. And upward along that pallid path, my fevered fancy pictured a thin shadow, slowly writhing, a vague, contorted shadow, struggling as if it were drawn by unseen demons. Crazed as I was, I saw in that awful shadow a monstrous resemblance, a nauseous, unbelievable caricature, a blasphemous effigy, of him who had been Dennis Barry. And that's why you don't drain swamps. Bad shit happens. What next? Necronomicon, Irish, or Halloween? hearing none <clears throat> I'll decide do 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 diddly do 
Alright. We'll do... Waters Strangely Clear. From Alan Baxter. Under gray skies, threatening rain. Howard Block drove east, behind the wheel for hours already. And still Skye's voice echoed through his mind, biting, mocking him. So you're really going? I have to, infuriated at her refusal to understand. <laughs> A Halloween party? You're a grown man. It's our conference. It's my job. The conference? Disdain drooled from the word is a lame excuse for grown adults to act like children. I'm a regional sales manager. Years' targets and strategies are laid out over three days as an excuse to then have a lame-ass party. So much more hung off that phrase. Lame-ass job, lame-ass husband, lame-ass man. He had shrugged. No idea how to respond. You're really going? to talk about tacky Halloween decorations instead of staying to save us. Is there us anymore? He'd asked. I guess not. Her eyes were wet with anger and hurt as she turned away. Without another word, he'd wheeled his suitcase out to the car and driven off. On I-95, somewhere north of Boston, Howard's eyes were wet too. He loved Skye had loved her more than life itself. His breezy, beautiful songstress. She'd loved his ability. He, she'd loved his stability after a childhood with commune-loving parents who spent their days stoned, talking about permaculture farming and the spirits of the wind. But her spirit had been like the wind, too. Perhaps it was inevitable that she would grow bored of him. Was that what all it was? Boredom? Their life lacked adventure. That was the one constant complaint from Sky. You're so pragmatic. There's not an esoteric bone in your body. Isn't that why she married him? Maybe they should have had kids, but that was something she resisted. No, no, no. Kids don't solve things. Their slight misalignment on so many things seemed to have widened through the years. Until now, all the gaps appeared insurmountable. He took the Yankee Division Highway off I-95, squinted at his phone's GPS as it directed him toward Essex Bay. The leaden skies broke, rain bucketing over the windscreen. Windscreen? It's called a windshield. Hello? Are you from here? As his family spotted the sign directing him north. Innsmouth. Six miles. Backwater place for the conference, Howard muttered, as the day grew unseasonably dark, even for the end of October. Head office had sung the virtues of the location, old world charm, and powerful sense of the macabre, like a town that time forgot. This year's an auspicious one for the company, the memo had said, and were returning to the source for a very special conference. Perfect for the best Halloween party yet devised, apparently. Oh god, the Irish is back. Alright. We'll stick with the Irish. Always in a place of Christmas celebration. Day and Conan made its fortune from Halloween merchandise. So that holiday was its central focus. Until now, the annual conference had always been in Pittsburgh, much nearer to Howard. Why the CEO, Jeffrey Day, had insisted on the change was a mystery. Wolfie out there poking fun at other cultures. Okay, okay, okay. You live closer to Massachusetts than I do, Sassy. Do they call it a windscreen over there and not a windshield? I need to know. I have to know. 
I'm guessing by quick is no clue. Do you call it a windshield? You must, right? Who the fuck calls it a windscreen? What the fuck is wrong with my fingers? <laughs> I mean, did you stab yourself today? <laughs> I've been not using my index finger as a result. Alright, moving on. Howard drove past Essex Bay, out of sight in the darkness somewhere east of him, and entered Innsmouth. He was exhausted, eyes red and gritty from the long journey, strained from staring through the downpour. All he wanted was a hot bath and a soft bed. Tomorrow would be better. He missed the sky already. The rain fell hard and heavy, and he slowed, staring past the swiftly whipping dark. Wait, nope. Nope. Staring past the swiftly whipping wipers. Jesus Christ. Swiftly whipping wipers at a town of wide extent and dense construction. Everywhere seemed dark and still, though it was only just before seven o'clock. Few lights shone in the windows, chimney pots stood inert on sagging gambrel roofs. As the road descended toward the harbour, the sense of broken down decay became stronger. Some roofs fallen in entirely, some walls missing windows like skulls with black empty eye sockets. Other buildings were in better condition. Georgian houses with cupolas and widow's walks guarded by curly cued iron ra railings. Three tall steeples stood out against the ocean horizon, black against the dark of night. Howard drove past a factory built of brick, sturdier looking than most buildings he had seen, though the majority of the rest of the waterfront bore structure seemingly uninhabitable due to decay. Not so much old world charm, but a derelict forgotten ghost town. Where was everyone? He passed the sand clogged harbour, surrounded by stone breaker walls, and there, on a slight rise above the small port, was the Deepwater Hotel. That, at least, was well lit, an air of vibrancy about it. He turned onto Marron Road, taxis a lot and parked, a hammer of rain the only sound, as he killed the engine. Cold permeated the car, as though the turning of the key had swung wide some unseen refrigerator door behind him. With a shiver he got out, hunched against the rain, to smell a sharp, briny tang of salt water and old sea seaweed on the icy breeze. He dragged his case from the trunk and ran to the hotel lobby. No one greeted him at the door, the reception desk and land. From somewhere distant, he heard the quiet murmur of voices and the chink of glasses. He realized a stiff drink before his bath and bed would be most welcome, assuming it didn't involve too much socializing. He wasn't yet ready for people. Sky's disappointment still raw and smarting. Had she really finished with him right there by the front door? The chasm between them finally whole? Surely there was a way to find common ground again if they tried. Help you. Conference, is it? Howard jumped, the disembodied voice, sudden and sibilant. He turned, no one to be seen. When he returned his gaze to the desk, he jumped again, a man waiting, as if he'd been there all along. Looking with one eyebrow raised, has he been there all along? Surely Howard would have noticed. The man's face was pale, almost grey, his mouth flat and wide, eyes too large as he stared. Yes, conference, Howard managed, unsettled by the cold perusal. Howard Block, he added, and spelled out his name. People always assumed a CK. 315, third floor. No lift broken, stirs that way. The pointing finger was greyer than the man's face, long and trembling slightly as it indicated dark wooden stairs, highly polished, with a thick banister and intricate balusters like kelpweed twisting upward. Howard glanced down at 
his heavy case, fatigue sinking deeper into his bones. He opened his mouth to speak, and the clerk said, No, Bill Boy. Finished for the day. Right. Howard took the offered key, careful not to touch the pale hand, and turned away. Dagon's eyes see you. Howard turned back. Pardon me? I said, have a nice day. The man's expression was unchanged, without any apparent emotion. Right, Howard said again. Thanks. He wheeled his case toward the stairs, but was intercepted by someone emerging from a pair of heavy wooden double doors to one side. Howie Block! Howard winced, but he couldn't help smiling. Alas, some normalcy. Something familiar. Dean Stringer, how many times do I have to tell you not to call me Howie? His mother had called him that. Her soft voice. Plaintive, plaintive as she mollified him after another of his alcoholic father's outbursts. His mother's own breath, sour with bourbon and cigarettes and surrender. Oh, <laughs> ow! He'd always promised himself any marriage of his would never be like theirs. Instead, he managed to make one so dull that he withered on the vine and died. Dean Stringer smiled. Howard, sorry. Get to see you, man. You too. They shook hands. Dean's grip firm and vigorous. You believe this place? Like something from, I don't even know. It's pretty weird. The boss man says it's important to be here on this particular Halloween. Reckons it's perfect time for company growth. Perfect time? Alignment to the stars or some shit. Stringer laughed, shrugged. Great location for us though, right? Try selling these people Halloween decor, that'd be like selling snow to the Eskimos, am I right? <laughs> Probably test your skills, Mr. Regional Sales Manager of the Year. Howard laughed. That was last year. Maybe this year too. We'll find out in three days. We'll see. Honestly, Howard doubted that he'd qualify. He worked well, always had. But the slow dissolution of life with Sky, particularly over the last few months as the breakdown gained momentum, had certainly affected his performance. It must have affected his sales, even though he had met all of his targets. Someone else surely would have exceeded theirs by more. Drink! Dean explained, exclaimed. Come on! In my bag, Howard said weakly. I've only just driven in. I feel rumbled. A drink first! The hotel bar was busy with day and gone. Day and... Day and gone. Oh. A day gone. I get it. The hotel bar was busy with day and gone incorporated staff and the buzz of life and activity was like a bath in and of itself. Howard drank his first beer reluctantly, but soon relaxed and met others he knew well. New employees he hadn't met before. He felt isolated among the crowd, but bourbon full of beer. And in an hour, he was warm and laughing, not sparing a thought for life beyond the job. Dizzy and staggering, he fumbled the key into the lock of 315, left his clothes on the floor as he fell into bed a little after midnight. Sheets were so cold they felt damp. The high ceiling was pressed with metal edges, spotted with blackened mold and rippled with water stains. But he didn't think much of it, before sleep crossed him over like a wave. Howard woke from dreams of rolling seas and curled stomachs, of leaning over the sides of creaking boats with peeling paint, staring into gloomy depths where things unrecognizable looped and flew. His mouth was dry and furry, his head thick. He staggered from bed, went to the small bathroom to piss, and winced at the yellow-stained toilet bowl. The rust streaked tub with its dripping power head, shower head, lumpy with lime scale, but relieved and revitalized with a long drink, though the water was bitter and hard. He returned to the room and to the small window. His view looked south over the harbor. He smiled. The rain had eased though the skies were still slate and people milled in the street. Some buildings seemed to be shops with their doors open. Everything appeared more alive, more intact than it had been the rain-soaked night before. Howard was glad of that. After a breakfast in the bustling hotel dining room, bustling only due to his fellow company staff, 
He headed into the main conference rooms and was soon lost. In the business of sales districts, new products, electronic gadgets to hide around the house to turn into new terrifying haunted experience. These were things he understood. During lunch, he was slapped hard on the back by Jeffrey Day, CEO. The man was tall and broad, with a wide face and protuberant eyes, not so pale as the desk, desk clerk the night before. Howard was nonetheless struck by their similarity. Good to see you, Block, Day exclaimed. All well. Absolutely, Howard lied, thoughts of Sky slipping back into the cracks between his thoughts and hurried away. By evening, he was back in the bar, sampling food and more of the booze. One day down, two to go, then the party. He began to relax. Dinner was ordinary and uninspiring fish stew with hard, tasteless bread. But he and Dean had decided to go further afield the next day and explore the town, find restaurants to try. Thankful though he was to have Dean nearby, he had trouble connecting with anyone else. The faces all blurring into one seething mass. He shouldn't be here, not really. He was made remote by thoughts of home and sky. And that made him tense and bitter, hurt by the thought that their marriage was done. They should have had kids. No, they should not. He should have insisted. No, he should not have. He smarted. Then now they never would. He dodged the bullet! But it wasn't too late. Yes, it is. Avoiding conversation, Howard found himself on a weathered leather, leather bench seat when a slim, dark-haired woman of young middle age sat beside him. He estimated she might be five or six years younger than his grizzled thirty-nine, and she retained an attractiveness that spoke of youth, turning eyes wherever she went. A general conversation lulled, she smiled at him, held out a long-fingered, slim hand. Daria. Howard. Daria is a lovely name. He took her hand, glanced down at his icy coldness. I never could get used to New England winters. So I went away. I'm always cold. It's barely autumn yet. She gave a shrug. Yet it's already freezing. It's so damp here, too, Howard said. Always. Mean sea, by the way. I thought I saw something shift, but I guess I did not. Oh, we're good. What does? Daria. It's Iranian. Oh, right. You're Iranian? No, my parents just liked it. I'm New England born and bred. Howard laughed. Yet you never got used to the winters. No, that's why I went away. Silence fell, a moment of awkward strangeness following the awkward conversation. Daria flicked another smile, and Howard sucked in a quick breath and tried to rein in a sudden disorientation. Drink, he said. Daria visibly reacted. Eyes crinkling. Yes, a vodka and soda. You got it. Dean stood at the bar, half a smile pulling up one side of his mouth like he'd been caught by a fisherman. What are you grinning about? Dean nodded back toward the table in the corner. Wait, fuck. Oh, what are you... What are you going about? Dean nodded back toward the table in the corner. Chat up with the new girl, huh? New is she? I haven't seen her before. No one I spoke to as. Must be new. Howard grunted. And I'm not chatting her up. What, because you're married? What happens on tour stays on tour, buddy. I won't tell your wife. Gee, thanks. How's your wife? Dean grimaced. Honestly, I don't think we'll be together much longer. Feeling a bit lost, truth be told. Long story. I'll tell you later. Howard nodded, unsure what to say. He was certainly the last person to offer advice. Dean gathered up four glasses and a tenuous two-handed grip. He returned to his table, where several employees sat laughing and talking over one, each other, one another drunkenly. Howard waited at the bar, and eventually the woman serving her turned his attention to him. He startled slightly, convinced for a moment that it was the desk clerk from the night before wearing a straggly ash blonde wig. The resemblance to each other was uncanny, but the woman had kind of a fatty lump just below her bottom lip, and her eyes a pale grey where the man's had been sickly green. 
may most surely be related, though. Family business, Howard presumed. He ordered the drinks, bourbon and coke for himself, and returned to Daria. The conversation with Messi continued to be awkward, but they drank more and cared less. Daria moved closer, put a hand on his arm, his knee, his thigh. In her presence, he felt dizzy and weirdly dislocated. He repeatedly pushed away thoughts of Sky, playing over and over again. In the back of his mind, those last words. Is there us anymore? I guess not. The evening rolled on and the bar became ever less occupied. Then Daria leaned forward, whispering. Her lips were cold against his ear. But the words heated him. Shall we go upstairs? My room? he asked, trembling like a teenager. She nodded, slipped her fingers around his, gently pulled him up and away. They climbed the stairs quickly, stumble, stumbling drunkenly and giggling. In his room, they didn't speak again, and did exactly what you expect them to do. Um. Da -da 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 -da. Kissing ever. ever da -da -da. Her tongue was cold and brackish in his mouth, as though she had drunk vodka and seawater all night. Not vodka and soda, but the taste wasn't unpleasant. As they kissed, he became deep, dizzier still, lost and lost in booze. She was cold all over. Poor thing, not lying about never getting warm. Ah, uh, okay, we don't need to read that. Jesus Christ. Anyway, they did some things that you certainly shouldn't do if you're underage, and should certainly use protection for. But the sex was good, and that's what matters. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, Howard dreamed of a city underwater. Its twisting spires stretched up through water strangely clear. The surface of... <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Summarize a little bit of smut for you. I'm not reading that shit on stream. Uh, my balls are not that big. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> it was pretty graphic. It was pretty explicit. I wasn't expecting it. I'm like, surely they're gonna gloss over this shit. No, they did not. <laughs> they did not indeed gloss over that shit. Oh. Oh no. Alright. Oh, okay. Oh. Anyway. Fuck no. Howard dreamed of a city underwater. Its twisting spires stretched up through the water, strangely clear. The surface of the ocean unseen far above. This was no earthly sea, that he knew without doubt, intrinsically. This place existed everywhere, just below the surface of real life. It could be entered from anywhere, go from it to anywhere else, like it flowed intertwined with the threads of the tapestry of reality. Howard walked its streets, marveling at the serpentine architecture, rounded byways, the smoothness of every feature. Straps of kelp rose in clumps, undulating in soft currents. He came to a temple in the city center, a tower of entwined columns, winding upward, winding upward even, surrounded by smaller spiraling towers buttressed to the middle with arcs of dark stone. Giant double doors, forty feet high, thirty feet wide, were inscribed with disturbing symbols, swung silently open, as he realized everywhere was silent. Inside the temple, rows of pews ro rose from the ground, 
as if carved, or so they had been grown, like intricately managed coral. Hundreds of people occupied them, rocking gently as if moved by the kelp, like the kelp, by deep, gentle waves. All had hoods or long hair overshadowing their faces, not a visage visible in the dimness. An altar at the end of the temple stood on a rise to dais, impossible, impossibly tall figures stalking slowly around it. Whip thing and angular in their movements, they reached long, stick-like arms toward the congregation. Those arms bent once about a th one third along, forearm too short, and they bent further up, double elbows uncannily placed, as they gestured complicated patterns, a silent sign language. Howard could not understand, but yearned to know. He realized he was holding his breath. Had been all along for how long? Hours? He knew if he breathed in, he would drown. But suddenly felt like he was drowning anyway. A part of him longed for that watery suffocation. Panicking, he gasped. Eyes cold to see the water flooding his mouth and lungs. He jerked awake, bounced on the cold bed, heart pounding, breath short. He tasted salt water, but realized that would be from the kissing Daria, not from the dream. Wouldn't it? He rolled over and saw she was gone. Disappointment carved a hole in him. His brain was foggy with sleep, with drink, with the remains of the powerfully clear dream. He lurched from bed to piss, the air cold against his damp skin. His feet squidged against the hard-worn carpet as he walked, leaving a trail of wet footprints. Still drunk, confused, bereft, he ignored it, pissed and fell back into bed, and a restless dream of sleep. You're not the only one who got lucky last night. Dean was enthusiastic over breakfast in the hotel, dining room, of dark wood and sallow serving staff. They looked a lot like each other. It was how big was this family running this business? What do you mean? Howard had a headache from the ruptured sleep and too much bourbon, his moon sullied, but I hadn't guilt over what he'd done. He and Skye weren't finished yet, and Daria hadn't even stayed the night, creeping out like it was nothing but a booty call. There had been a test message from Skye when he woke. Sweetheart, we really need to talk. When you get back, let's take a break somewhere. We need time together. She was prepared to accept reconciliation. And so was he, desperate for it, in fact. But would he have to tell her about last night? Could he live with the guilt either way? He found himself questioning what the fuck he was doing about anything in his life, but knew one thing. He wanted Sky. Dean was saying something. So sorry, what? Man, you were out of it. Too much drink, eh? I was saying a few of us scored last night. The girl you took upstairs, she's not with a conference, she's local. Howard frowned, nodded dumbly. She said something about that, but she moved away. There's a few of them. They came to hang out, knowing we were in town. Dean le leaned forward, conspira conspiratorial. Look at most people here, who can blame them? It's like they central in this town, right? Howard tried to remember what he and Daria had talked about all evening, but it was hazy. He couldn't remember which at all. You score two, then? The team beamed. And it was good, man. Was she... Howard swallowed, shook his head. He'd been about to say was she cold, but that seemed absurd. Was she what? It doesn't matter. Good for you, man. He pushed his plate aside, appetite gone. I, I gotta call my wife. A <laughs> guilty conscience. Dean green grinned and mouthful of toast, wagged a butter knife like an accusatory finger. Howard walked around the harbor, talking to Skye about the future, and he felt encouraged. The conversation was uncomfortable, but she reiterated her desire for a break. He said he would like that. She told him to enjoy his conference and the party. It sounded as though she meant it. He hung up, racked with guilt. He looked around, wondering if he might see more Vinsmith before before day two of the conference, but though the town was nearly as dilapidated as he thought that first night, it was still run down, dirty, uninviting. Pale, wide faces stared out the door frames, as if wishing him away, hoping he wouldn't stray into their shop. The large building had a peeling sign, 
Marin Shipping and Freight. He'd seen the name in several places around town. For some reason, that unsettled him. The shiver, he returned to the hotel. During lunch, after eating flowery apples and damp sandwiches of fish paste, Howard went upstairs to nap, to catch up from his disturbed sleep of the night before. He dreamed again of the underwater city, walked to the high, wide doors, but paused, nervous. He thought of Daria, of the sky, cried out with frustration. Ice water flooded his mouth and he startled awake. His clothes were wet, like the mother of all cold sweats. He changed and went back downstairs for the afternoon session. What he would give to be warm and dry. Rather than the unwelcoming streets with Dean, he ate at the hotel stool again. He ate the hotel stool again. Same lumpy casseroles before. Meat was tough for fish, odd lumps in places, gravy, waxy and thick. He'd kill for a good old burger and chips, but he didn't really care. He thought only of seeing the conference out, enjoying the party, and then getting home to Sky. And the party now seemed like a chore. Sky had been right, it was grown adults trying to recapture lost childhood and it was sad. Hotel had used the company's products to decorate in preparation and it all stuck him as garish and tacky. He promised himself he wouldn't drink again, but Dean returned and bought the first round and anything seemed better than sobriety at that point. By around 10 o'clock he was warmly inebriated, relaxing, when Daria appeared before him. I'm sorry I left without saying goodbye. You were sleeping. You were very deep. Howard licked suddenly dry lips. I didn't expect... You didn't expect me back. I had to work, but I came as soon as I was finished. She raised a glass, clinked it against his. He opened his mouth to speak, to say something about Sky, about his life, but she silenced him with cold lips over his. Oh, dear God. Here we go again! Yeah, I'm just gonna... She's cold, and she does things very intensely, and that's all you need to know. I'm just speed reading through this. Fast forward, right? Okay. Ba ba da ba 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 da 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 da. Oh. Also, she might be a fish. Because she has gills. And he's finding this out as he's. Um. There's no good way to say this. Shaft deep. Anyway, Howard dreamed again of the Serpentine Temple, the tall, rangy priests exhorting the congregation with complicated signs. As he stared, he began to somehow understand the gestures. He is ready to rise, and he has slept for long enough. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Something in the broken, truncated messages called, caused reels of terror to flood through Howard as he felt intense pressure of his held breath. He wanted to breathe deeply and join the huddled masses, and simultaneously wanted to run far away to Sky and feel the genuine warmth of her embrace. The urge to run worn out, and he stumbled from the temple, along the softly winding streets. He remembered this ocean was not earthly, but a place between, a place that flowed within all things. He kicked hard from the street and swam up, keeping only Sky in his mind, and found himself swimming over their shared bedroom so far away. She slept there, alone in the bed, one arm thrown across where he should have been. Across her pillow was the shirt he'd been wearing the day before he left, looking rumpled and unwashed. Aww. She must have had it there for the scent of him. His heart ached. He gasped. Ice water rushed through him, and he woke. Daria was gone. The mood in the dining room was somber, faces dark. It took a moment to find out why. But Howard soon discovered there had been a tragedy. Dean Stringer was dead. What happened? Howard asked of Sarah Cheeseman. 
taking a spare seat at the table she shared with two others. Drowned, Sarah told him. What? But found in his bed, Gary Clark said, shaking his head. Drowned in his bed? Gary barked a laugh. According to the authorities, I heard him talking to the boss. He fell in the harbor and drowned late last night. The local carried him to the bed, not realizing he was dead, just thinking he was drunk. Howard frowned. Who does that? Gary shrugged. No idea. But you can't actually drown in your bed, can you? Jeff Day was here a moment before you arrived, Sarah said, despite the horrible bell event, or her to see through the conference and the party. That's what Dean would have wanted, according to Day. Gary said, his face bleak. Howard mechanically wet, forked wet, thin scrambled eggs into his mouth, not really tasting them. Howard wanted to go home, but it was October 31st, last day of the conference in Halloween. It was a long drive. He was prepared to make his excuses to leave, but Jeff Day was open proceedings with the request everyone honored Dean Stringer by sticking together. Considering the day and gone, incorporated family had meant so much to Dean. Had it really? Howard wondered. Haunted faces filled the auditorium, all wearing a mask of determination. He would look like a dick if she ran out now. Call me superstitious, if you will, Day said in a strong voice. But this Halloween sees planetary conjunction that occurs only once every few hundred years. And it's happening on our day. Halloween. That's why we're here, in this place, at this time. We'll see our numbers grow. Day went on to announce the best performers of the year, and Howard gasped when he was named again as regional sales manager of the year. Confused by the applause and faces that still bore shock under a veneer of celebration, he went on stage, accepted his plaque and bonus check. How could he have outperformed everyone despite his crumbling life? Was this competition here that week? He needed more from his life than everything represented by this award. And he knew there was so much more to be experienced. During lunch, he called Sky and said how much he missed her, and he wasn't lying. But something else had occurred to him, and he knew it would appeal to her esoteric mindset. I'm going to swim in the sea of dreams tonight and come to you, he said, huddled for privacy in a corner under the polished stairs. <laughs> she laughed. <laughs> that right. I'm serious. This place has been giving me crazy dreams. Last night I swam to you and watched you sleeping. That's a little creepy, love. No, it was beautiful. It sounds like a nice dream, she said, amending her opinion. He took a deep breath, ready to test his theory. You're sleeping with my blue shirt on your pillow. Her gasp at the other end was quickly suppressed in a moment of silence. Sky? How could you know that? I think it's wonderful. But how could you know? I told you, I've been dreaming. Deep thinking you can imagine. I'll come tonight in your dreams and we'll swim together. Sky laughed again, but there was an edge of nervousness to it. <laughs> You're kind of freaking me out, but okay. I look forward to that. The conference wrapped, and when they emerged from the meeting rooms back into the bar, it was dressed up like a funfair haunted house. Cobwebs everywhere, bats and pumpkins, and witches on brood mistakes swung from every available point. Jesus Christ, this is long. When does this end? Oh, it's almost over. Blah, blah, blah. Music blared from the rig of a DJ in one corner. Rotating light with blue and green filters turned, casting a flickering underwater shades across the halls and ceiling. Blood and drinks. Wow! Food and drinks were laid out on the tables. Howard ignored it all, keen to be on his own. Dari came to him, her hips swaying like a soft tide. Eyes hooded. He saw her now as cold and dangerous. The image of Dean with another woman disturbingly similar to Daria leapt through his mind made his stomach turn. She yelled out a drink, began to say something. Howard push pushed the drink aside, shook his head. Not tonight, no more, okay? Her face flashed fury for a startling moment. Sharp teeth bristled behind her full lips. Three slits either side of her throat gaped angrily and flattened shut again. Howard's mouth fell open. Fear trickled through his limbs. 
Daria's expression softened as, he ga as she glanced past Howard's shoulder. He turned to see what she was looking at and saw Jeff Day gesture to the woman, his fingers mimicking the silent sermons he had watched in his dreams. Enough. Howard's eyes widened as he turned back to see Daria's reaction. She'd already turned away, offering a drink to another employee. Gary Clark, he realized absently. He had spoken to over breakfast. Howard looked back at Jeff Day. The boss was already deep in conversation with others, his face wide with laughter. Howard hurried to his room. He locked the door inside with a relief. All he wanted to do was hold Sky. He really wanted to show her the wonders of the world he'd discovered under reality. The peculiarity of people notwithstanding, that place called to him, cajoled him to fly in its endless depths. But he had to take Sky there. He would show her adventure. He could ignore the dark city. People be damned, he and Sky had journeys to enjoy. He watched the hours crawl by until he was sure Sky would be in bed, and fell to his cold, damp sheets and closed his eyes. He relaxed and breathed deeply, thinking only of sleep in the deeps of the ocean below the world. He smiled as he gently walked the streets of the Serpentine City, supported by the salt waters of infinity. Not to be tempted, he kicked away and swam up, distancing himself from the temple, thinking only of Sky. He saw the floral designs on the bed, linen in the shadows beneath him, and swam down to her. He held his breath, and his lungs began to burn, but he knew he'd held it for impossibly long periods before this dream on previous nights. He could hold it longer still, long enough to show her the wonders. He put a hand on Skye's shoulder, and she startled awake, looked around herself with wide eyes. Then she looked up at Howard, her expression both impressed and full of disbelief. He nodded, pointed to the pillow below her, his shirt. You're dreaming, he said, with complicated patterns of his fingers that suddenly came as naturally as blinking. We're dreaming together in the oceans of infinity. He pushed aside his guilt at thoughts of what he'd done with Daria, took Skye's hand. She let herself be lifted, and they swam together. Not sure where to go, they drifted, and then there was the city below them. He was shocked to see the entire congregation in the streets outside the temple, looking up with wide, sad faces. Tall priests stalked among them, more than a dozen of them. And then, as one, they turned their thin faces upward too, their wrongly jointed arms raised, and together they spoke in sign, telling Howard and Sky to breathe, to let infinity in, and feel the sac sacred blessing of the eternal Dagon. Of course. Howard laughed, knowing that any resistance was pointless. The ocean was already in him. Had been since his lips had first touched Daria's. This was inevitable. He turned to Sky. Her face was twisted in terror, eyes wide. She shook her head side to side, her hair floating behind her like a halo in the currents. She opened her mouth to scream, tried to pull away from him, but he held her tight his hands around her upper arms. He opened his mouth and drew a great breath of salty ice water and nodded at her to do the same. As her scream came to an end, she had no choice but to do so, as he refused to let go. This was them together at last. Always together. Jeff Day, CEO of Day and Gone Inc., stood with Cecil Merrill, the Innsmouth Chief of Police, Jeff's cousin on his mother's side. Beside them stood Stanley Maron, Cecil's brother, the town's forensic examiner. They surrounded Howard Block's hotel bed, where Howard lay cold and wet. His blackened eyes stared unseeing at the mold-stained ceiling. You filed the paperwork? Jeff Day asked his cousins. Cecil nodded. Drowned in the harbor. All the thing. Stanley signed off the sheets of paper on the battered clipboard, then returned it to his cousin. Next to Ken? Day asked. Cecil laughed. Clotted wet sound. <laughs> Wife. Spoke to the local PD this morning. This is the damnedest thing. They found her dead in her bed at home, all signs point to drowning. 
Day joined in the laughter as they left the room, allowing the hotel staff and to tidy up. Dagon's eyes see you, Day said to his cousins as they parted in the hotel lobby. And find you pious, they both replied in unison as they stepped out into the rain. Well, that was unnecessarily sexual. The fuck? So anyway, don't fuck fish. You know, you'd think these things were obvious, but that's the moral of the story. Of course it is. Should we read one more? Hmm. Yeah, this one's short. Ish. This one shorter. No. Hold on. Okay, we've read The Hound last year. That I remember. Well, let's read Dagon. Why not? Oh. I remember Tenchi reading this. Here. And let me change the to something more appropriate. I know exactly what I'm looking for. Or so I thought. Come on. Yeah, that'll do. I'm writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight shall be no more, penniless and at the end of my supply of the drug which makes, which alone makes life endurable. I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess 
though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degeneration, so that her vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst to be of her crew were treated with such all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal indeed was the discipline of our captors, that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely, by the sun and stars, that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no south, no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for a passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land, but neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon heaving vastnesses of unbroken blue. The change happened while I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I had awakened, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations, as far as I could see, in which my boat lay grounded in some distance away. The one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished, for there was in the air, and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish, and other, less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing, nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime, with the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from the sky, which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing reason regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under the unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of this new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might, nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. For, for several hours I sat thinking of brooding in the moat, which lay on its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for travelling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to my mind so slight and evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock, which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still travelled toward the hummock, 
though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I first espied it. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, an intervening valley, setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy indeed. I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illuminate. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal light. Though my terror ran curious reminiscence of Paradise Lost, and Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and, ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for descent, and most after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse, which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object. that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I sh soon assured myself. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. Closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. For despite its enormous magnitude, its position in an abyss which I had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, Perceived beyond a doubt, the strange object was a well shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed the chasm, and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed to the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had seen in books, consisting, for the most part, of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed in the ocean risen plain. Was the pictorial carving, however, that did the most to hold me spellbound, plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, was an array of bas reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of Doré. I think those things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, that the creatures were shown, disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto paying homage at some monolithic shrine. 
which appeared to be under the waves as well. On their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, if the mere re remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures were so in the act of killing a whale represented as but a little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, the grotesqueness and strange size, and in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished years before the first ancestor of the Piltdom, of the Neanderthal man, was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing while the moon cast queer reflections over the silent channel before me. And suddenly I saw it, with only a slight turning to mark its rise to the surface. A thing slid into view above the dark waters. A vast, polyphemus-like and loathsome, darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms. The while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. My frantic ascent, the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I'd reached the boat. At any rate, I knew that I'd heard peals of thunder and other uh, tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in San Francisco Hospital, brought thither by the captain of an American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found my words had been given scant attention. Of any land of people in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist, and amused him with particular questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. But soon perceiving he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease. It has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account of the information, with a contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Often I ask myself, it, it could not have all been a fear of phantasm, a mere freak of fever, as I lay some stricken on a raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideous vivid vision and reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless thing that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols, and carving their own detestable likeness on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny or exhausted mankind of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a voice at the door, as if some immense slippery body lumbering against it shall not find me. God, that hand. The window. The window. Dagon.
Also my voice, probably. And there's the shadow of Innsmouth. But that seems... Oh, that's a, that's a story. That is long. And best suited for another time. Yeah, we'll stick with the Necronomicon. I don't need to be reading softcore porn to you guys. <clears throat> but yes. That was what I have for you today. So it will come to pass that I will do more spooky stories. It may not be this month. Uh, we might have to wait. Drink some water. Yeah, I will. I've been reading to you guys for about two hours now. So. I could round it out with some Mahjong. As a matter of fact, I think I may. But first, I'm going to put my laptop on the charger because I've been reading from it and it has not been charging. How you doing, chat? Spooky time is all the time in your heart? Oh, hell yeah. Always and forever. Um, hello. Thank you. No. Spooky time is a state of mind. I'd love to do like a Halloween for Christmas sort of thing. I feel like that would be really cool. If we if we pulled that. We gotta remember that actually. Since I'm not vacationing at that time anymore. Due to, you know, COVID. Alright, let's disappoint Edgehead. Sorry, Edgehead. Betty bring me some small drink. Alright, so right off the bat, this shit. And that shit. Those are at more risk. You think the threes that I see. This five, there's nothing more valuable. This, I'm not sure about. Those are pretty good. This fives are trying to that. I'd love to get rid of. Oh, that's unfortunate. I'll be a swimming forest island. I might be able to do... Okay, what's under here? That gives me a 7. That's kind of peculiar. Let's try you. These are okay. Grabs me that. These three. That north is... we'll get rid of it because we need... Ah, alright. 
little holes into my eyelids. I could do that. I don't desire that though. Okay, this can go. That seven. Honestly, not the most helpful thing ever. These are almost somewhere. This, let me remove. That gives me a seven. That gives me a two. That gives me this freedom. That six, I think it's the same one I've always been seeing. Those nines are trying. I'm actually gonna spare myself that. Eights, I don't know. I might. Let me do this, actually. It gives a seven, that gives a one. Those are not helpful. This can go. Ah. That stings of regret. Um. Oh, he's far outpaced me. Those can go. That's gonna be a problem. These norths are fine. Those are fine. Those twos. I'm gonna remove that because that's not in the way of anything. That I'll spare. Only for now. Six must go. The five is gone. That five is going to be problems. That four is of no help. Those are not going to help me. I gotta just go. That gives a nine. That I might be able to spare, but I don't. I don't think I have the skill for that anymore. Those ones are okay, that can go, this is fine, that's in there, that's fine, this is good, that's less good. He's run into trouble, I've run into trouble. That's seven's problem. I'm hoping that this, alright, we're in spit and distance. Ages ago in the first story, it wouldn't surprise me. Poor kid's been exhausted. He's He's been having a rough go of it lately. Uh, that five could go. Mm -hmm. I think I'll go with that. I think I'm alright with that risk. This three is not gonna budge the way I want it to, is it? Okay, I see them there. I'm actually gonna do this. Those threes are okay. This nine feels like it's got an antidote. I know I've matched those. That seven's gotta go. These are fine. I'm actually gonna sear that open. Grab those out. Yeah, those be damned. I don't know what to do with them, so I won't do anything. Those nines feel possible. These twos I really don't know though. I'm gonna take a risk. Yeah, it feels... It feels like the right call. Except for that bit. That bit worries me. Those sixes are fine. That does not help. It's gonna need to go. Okay. All that for nothing. The sevens are fine. That can go. That gives me this. 
that's a little scary. Okay. We are close. We just need... We just need to be relentless. That six has... Alright. I'm not gonna invest in things that have no hope. Uh, hello. What the fuck? Alright, I'm lost. Okay, so that's there. This is gonna go there, that's gonna go there, this is gonna go there, this there. This two's gonna just go. Should have looked for another, didn't. Um, yeah, just give me the loss. I think we could get it back, though. We'll do one more. We'll do one more. I'm surprised you didn't go for this, and I sort of wonder why. Those... that's an illusion. It's gonna go... Those twos could be saved. That I'm gonna go with. The seven feels possible. That five is a little bit yikes. Okay. Those eights feel like they've got something going on. Those can go... Yeah, that's the same shit that I was dealing with in a minute. Uh... That five seems doable. These seem more so. That's not in the way of anything. These are... Ah, oh, fuck me. I jumped. Okay. That's fine. We can... we can correct that. We can make it worth it. This bit... those fives actually seem okay. That too can go... Oh, I got crossed from the last game. This is in the way. I feel like I could dislodge it, but I'm not not sure how. That's in the way of more things. Those fives can go. Those souths exist. That two's in there. Uh, this I could dislodge. I could double we know that. I think I will. Those easts. If I dislodge the wests, I could get those. That nine is still still has things to it. That can go, that's where that was. I don't think I had a prayer of dislodging that. Meanwhile, this is still bullshit. Okay, so... That three is deep the fuck in there. I think we can get rid of... If I can get rid of those, those are that way. Those are good, that can get rid of that. Those can be resolved, that's fine. These fuckers are fine, we know about that. This, I think, is a good move, but I'm not... I'm not sold on it. That, that's gonna be hard. Oh, that's gonna be harder. Oh, sh sugar. I wanted to be wrong about that. Okay, so that can go... Alright, it wouldn't have been possible. Damn, he got himself knotted up. He got himself really tied up. What'd he do? There's no point in doing that one. It's always gonna be open. Uh, those are fine. That's fine. This nine's gonna go because it's blocking too much shit. 
That I'm gonna go with. Uh, I don't wanna do that. Can I remove this? I can remove this. Those sevens are there, I don't wanna do that. Alright, what's here? Fine. I'll play. There should be safer ways of doing that. Alright, so I'm gonna... Ah, oh, that's risky as fuck. I don't think I'm gonna do that. Okay. Uh, I know where that is, I just can't get to it. Three is there, but I don't know where that is. Okay, I guess I do. That four is just perched. That fucker's there. That one can help. If I can remove those, those should be fine. That opens up this shit. I should have done that before I did that, but I didn't. These seven seem good. Okay, we know that those are gone. Uh, I'll do that. Ooh. That's an unpleasant surprise. Okay. That's deep in there. How deep is deep? Uh, pretty fucking deep, actually. Deep enough that I don't think I can squirm it out. That seven's gonna go. I'd love to get rid of the six, I don't know how. Okay, that's gonna have to go. That one I don't know. And I just don't know. I, I just have no idea. That eight's gonna go, the seven's gonna go. Okay, that gives me that at least. That gives me four, that gives me this, this, this. That's gonna go, that's gonna go. Those sixes have to go in this order. Ah, yes. Okay, that kind of works out. This makes me slightly nervous. Okay. We look to be in good shape. F five more on. I did exactly the opposite of the thing I wanted to do. Exactly the opposite thing. It's too... I think we're fine. Okay, we're in the 80s. Hell yeah. Alright. And I think that is where I'm gonna call it. In the meantime though, do not eat or drink any questionable substances make smart decisions not die. Dying is absolutely forbidden, and I will see all of you wonderful people. At a later time. Take care, guys.